Hi, this is Sue Glenn. We are in Chapter 7 of the Manual Moles and Anna Scher uh, Ecology Textbook called Ecology Concepts and Applications, which was published by McGraw-Hill in 2019. And we've already had a lecture, a presentation on autotrophs, and this particular one is on heterotrophs. When we're dealing with heterotrophs then, uh, they're not able to produce their own food. So what they are doing is getting organic uh, molecules um, that have been produced from other living things to use um, not just as an energy source, but it's also their source of uh, nutrients and, and specifically uh, carbon is, is a major one. And we divide them up into different categories depending on what they eat. Uh, we do the same thing with people. Uh, so or herbivores obviously uh, feed on plants, but you could also have uh, specialized types of herbivores that eat on certain types of plants. So this is just a, a very broad classification system. We can have carnivores that eat on animal flesh. We have obligate on carnivores that only can eat uh, animals, like your, your cat. Um, but then we have others that can eat a mixture of plant and animals. Uh, and you might look at various types of uh, um, uh, omnivores that way. Uh, or you have specific carnivores that are only eating certain types of other animals, like they might be insectivores that are just eating insects, or they could be uh, piscivores that are just eating fish. And then they have, we have detritivores that are feeding on dead things, and they're extremely important because they're going to recycle all of those nutrients back into the food chain. So they're going to break things down into their nutrients so the plants can take those back up into the root, in their roots and uh, use them to make their molecules. When we look at uh, the nutrients that are around us in the world, uh, we have to kind of pick and choose what we need to make up the molecules in our body. And there's really five major ones that we're gonna, that most of our biomass of the plants, animals, the fungi, and bacteria are require. The carbon, which the plants are actually getting into the food chain by taking the carbon dioxide out of the air and putting it into the sugar in photosynthesis. We have oxygen uh, that we are uh, pulling in from the air. We have hydrogen that we get from our air and water and food, and nitrogen that we are we are getting from the the food. The plants got it from the soil. Uh, ultimately, had had come from nitrogen gas converted and put into the soil. Um, through various nitrification processes. Nitrogen is lower in plants. They're not quite as busy as we are, so they don't need quite as many enzymes to do a lot of things. So nitrogen content is relatively low in plants compared to in animals. We have a lot of protein that's contained a lot of nitrogen in the animals. Phosphorus, the same thing. So the phosphorus and nitrogen, the plants are getting out of the soil uh, and uh, tend to be lower in plants than they are in animals. In addition, vertebrates like us, we obviously need some calcium for our bones and teeth. When we look at what the plants are taking from the soil, um, there's quite a, a wish list of things that they are going to need. And uh, as the plant is young and growing, you can see that it's the, the young leaf tissue or the baby plant is really building everything from scratch. So it needs a, a lot more nutrients. And then the older plant is really um, uh, narrowing down on the nutrients that it requires and uh, just to maintain the structure that it has. So the older leaves uh, require much less than the, the young, young leaves of the plant. Now herbivores have a, a big chemistry problem because the herbivores are going to have to uh, get the nutrients, especially that nitrogen and phosphorus that they need out of the plants, and the plants don't have a lot of it. And uh, they're showing basically the ratio between the amount of carbon and the amount of nitrogen in the, the image on the left. So it's the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So the plants, uh, there's a lot of carbon for a little bit of light nitrogen. So there's much more carbon than nitrogen there. And uh, that means that these, these insects that are, that are eating the plants are, are requiring a lot more nitrogen. Their carbon to nitrogen ratio is uh, much more even. So in order to get the nitrogen they need, they're going to have to consume a lot of plant material in order to get the nitrogen that they're trying to get out of the plant. So the plant's got a lot of carbohydrates, um, not so much nitrogen. 
Same thing happens when we look at the carbon to phosphorus ratio, that the, the insects uh, have a very low carbon to phosphorus uh, ratio compared to the plants, and the plants have a huge carbon to phosphorus ratio. They don't have that much phosphorus in them, and so the, the insects are going to have to eat a lot of plant material in order to get the phosphorus that they need. So there really is um, a, a problem with trying to get the nutrients. Just, just looking at these uh, ratios is the subject of uh, ecological stoichiometry and it's really how you're you're balancing uh, the elements that are in the the plants and animals and making sure that you are eating the right combinations of things so that you're able to get the elements that you need In addition to just being able to consume the amount of plant material you're going to need, the plants don't necessarily want to be consumed. So the plants um, have uh, a lot of uh, physical and chemical defenses. Um, they might be uh, thorny, so that it just might be difficult to, to eat them. They might have um, uh, chemicals in them that are difficult to digest, something like uh, cellulose or lignin, which uh, strengthens the tissue, but it's also very difficult to digest uh, cellulose and lignin. Most animals can't digest either of those, uh, and then um, you know some can, like your, your horses and your cattle, your rabbits. Um, those that can digest them usually use bacteria, fungi, or even um, protozoa that live in their digestive tract that helps digest. It's sort of a symbiotic relationship. And, uh, and that, because we have these uh, symbiotes living in the system uh, in order to digest these things, uh, that probably uh, evolved a very long time ago uh, and, and is in a number of, of different organisms now that re rely on them to help them uh, break things down. Silica is a tough one. Silica, we find silica in grasses um, and what happens with silica is that uh, it's very abrasive and uh, it can actually uh, wear down the teeth. Like a, a lot of elephants will actually starve to death because of the silica has worn down their teeth to the point that uh, they, they're just not able to consume enough grass anymore in order to survive. This, this uh, is figure 11 out of the chapter, and it's looking at the carbon to nitrogen ratio in different types of plant tissue. So if we're looking at the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the uh, trunks of trees, there's a lot of carbon for every uh, little amount of nitrogen that we have. And uh, that means you'd have to eat a lot of trunks of trees, a lot of wood in order to get any nutritional value out of it beyond the carbon. So even if you could break down the cellulose and lignin, um, being able to get much else out of that is going to be very difficult. The branches you can see has a, has a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio, so you find a little bit more nutrient value in addition to the carbon in the branches. And then the needles are obviously um, the lowest carbon to nitrogen ratio. And uh, the needles actually have, this is looking at the pine tree trunks, the pine tree branches and the tr pine tree needles. Um, the needles are quite similar to the carbon to nitrogen ratio in plants that are growing on the forest floor. So when we're looking at herbaceous plants, these herbaceous plants are plants that uh, are not woody. So they'll die back in the winter time. They'll either die, set seed like an annual plant, or they could be a non-woody perennial like your dandelion in the garden, which dies back for the winter, but uh, the root's still alive underground and it'll sprout back from that root in the springtime. When we're also looking at ways of deterring you from eating things, uh, poisons, toxins, something that's going to make you throw up, something that's going to make it harder to digest the food, uh, things that will repel you, uh, things that uh, are going to combine with your enzymes and prevent you from breaking things down. And there are thousands of toxins in plants' tissues, and we just keep finding more and more. And uh, what we do find um, 
is that uh, in tropical plants, there's just so many things that want to eat you in, in the tropical rainforest that uh, they have huge numbers of these toxins in these, these tropical plants. And uh, a lot of these are alkaloids. And uh, alkaloids is a, an amazing group of, of chemicals that are found in the plants and probably you know, have the advantage of making the animals sick or they might taste bitter so the animal is not likely to, to eat it when it munches on one leaf. It says, I don't want any more of that. Um, and a lot of these uh, alkaloids are actually chemicals that we have uh, learned to make medicines out of. You have something that's going to uh, kill a fungus or kill a bacteria that's trying to destroy a plant, um, then that's going to be a good medicine for us. So this is where uh, we discovered uh, originally medicine was a branch of botany uh, where because we had so many uh, plant cures for things, understanding the plants and what compounds would cure various ailments uh, is where the birth of medicine came from. And uh, we can find that uh, high numbers of these toxins in tropical rainforest plants have actually been useful. We've found uh, things that we can actually make medicines out of in those. Um, phenols and ta tannins, if you go down to the Pine Barrens in New Jersey, you notice the water is that tea color. Um, those are the tannins in the water. They reduce your ability to digest uh, the carbohydrates and the, the food that you're eating, uh, which is a, a, obviously you, you're not going to choose eating something that you're not going to get as much um, useful uh, value from. Oh, this is this is cool. This is looking at the um, proportion of temperate plants and tropical plants that have toxic alkaloids in them, and those alkaloids are really good. Um, defenses against uh, being eaten. So if we look in the temperate areas, uh, we can see somewhere around 16% of the temperate plants will have uh, alkaloids in them, whereas some, somewhere close to 35% of the tropical plants will have alkaloids in them. Um, one group of plants that we uh, use quite regularly that have a lot of toxins in them uh, and is in the family of the Solanaceae. That family includes tomatoes and potatoes. And if you eat tomatoes and potatoes, um, the tomatoes fine to eat the potato is, but the rest of the plant is not. It is filled with alkaloids. It'll make you sick. Uh, so the rest of the plant is toxic. You can't eat potato leaves or or anything like that. Um, another plant that is in the Solanaceae is uh, tobacco. And uh, we know that there's a lot of uh, alkaloids in there, including um, uh, nicotine, which is actually used as a, uh, as a herbicide. Um, some insects have uh, evolved a resistance to some of these toxins. Um, there are bugs that can prey on, uh, that can eat uh, uh, tobacco plants because they're able to break down the, the nicotine. The milkweed plant has toxins in it and the monarch butterfly is able to lay its eggs on the milkweed and the caterpillars will take those toxins and sequester them into the vacuoles in their cells so that won't hurt the the caterpillars. Then when those caterpillars metamorphose into butterflies, uh, that big butter, beautiful butterfly, if a bird comes and eats a monarch butterfly, it, it tastes those toxins in the vacuoles and it throws it up, causes it to regurgitate the butterfly. And it'll remember that beautiful uh, black and orange butterfly tasted terrible and it'll never eat another one again. So it, uh, it's a really good prey defense. The, um, the detritivores obviously are feeding on the dead plant material, so they are also facing some of the stoichiometry problems that the herbivores um, are having. Um, they are extremely important because they're going to be returning the soil nutrients from the dead organic material. So we have them to thank for the fact that we're not up to our eyeballs and dead things around us. Um, the food that they eat uh, has a lot of carbon in it, has a lot of energy in it, but tends to be poor in nitrogen. If we look at dead leaves, they might have about half the nitrogen content of living leaves. And the longer the leaf has been lying on the ground, uh, the nitrogen has, has leached out of it. So fresh detritus can have um, 
uh, more nutrients than than stuff that's been sitting around. The problem with the fresh detritus is it still has all those other chemical defenses in it. So uh, it's maybe a little harder to break down right away because the detritivores are up against these toxins. This is looking at uh, leaves that have fallen on your lawn in the fall, and we can see the nitrogen content in the, the living leaves is much higher than the nitrogen content in your dead leaves. Now, what you should do though, when the leaves fall is not to rake them up right away, let the detritivores break them down and some of those, that nitrogen is gonna go back into your soil. It'll help your garden, your trees, your lawn, and then you don't have to fertilize. If you don't like the look of the leaves, you wanna rake them up. Uh, what I do is rake them into the garden, let them decompose over the winter. And that way all those nutrients go into my garden soil. And uh, what you're left with, with the when the earthworms have finished with breaking down your leaves you've got beautiful topsoil then so don't bag that stuff up don't give it away that's valuable nutrients and uh, will help your garden and lawn prey don't want to get eaten either so we're going to be talking about um, carnivores and uh, once again uh, when we're looking at stoichiometry, uh, if you're eating meat, if you're eating another animal, you're probably getting uh, just about the right amount of carbon to nitrogen, carbon to phosphorus ratios. So it's a re re nutritionally very rich, um, but obviously prey does not want to get eaten. And, uh, and so they have a number of different dis defenses. You might be spiny, you might have a hard shell, you might have some sort of repellent of some some uh, you know distasteful smell or uh, something that uh, if you bit me it would not taste good uh, poisons here's some poison um, dart frogs over here we've got uh, we could run away so you don't eat me I could hide uh, hang out in groups so you know don't stay stay off there alone where the wolf can pick you off hide in the middle of a herd uh, fighting, be feisty, make sure that they don't get you. Flashing, make sure that you startle them so that they they uh, will stop for a second and give you a chance to get away. Spitting's a nice one. Not not minding to do a little spitting when something's attacking me. Hissing. Anyone with a cat sees the spitting and hissing with their cat. So there's a lot of different types of prey defenses. Because of this, the um, the predator does not get to, to pick. Um, they don't get to choose who they get to eat. And uh, that way the, uh, the prey has a chance as well. Oh, screaming, yeah. I hate eating things that are screaming at me, don't you? Sometimes uh, animals that have a really good defense, like a poison, like those poison dart frogs, will have uh, bright colorful patterns like the monarch butterfly does to warn you, if you eat me, you're gonna throw up or you're gonna die. Uh, this is a bad thing and I will warn you so that you know what I look like. So if you've ever tried to eat one of my species before, you've already got an idea that never touched something that looks like this. Um, and that way uh, you've got this, this nocturnal animal. You'd think it would not want a big white stripe on its body uh, so it could camouflage better. But you see one of these, these cats out there with the big white stripes and you know, uh-oh, I'm in danger of something really stinky and uh, you will stay away from it. So you're not going to attack that. Now, some people's dogs are smarter than others and uh, learn from this and others just don't seem to learn. This is called aposematic coloring. <coughs> excuse me, aposematic coloring, and uh, it's really a warning. And uh, there's usually like, uh, when you see these color patterns, there's usually a really uh, bright contrast. It's really easy to see. So you think about the skunks with the black and white, Think about uh, bees and wasps with the uh, yellow and black, really clear bands. Uh, poisonous snakes are often very colorful. Poisonous butterflies are, are very colorful. One of the things we do find is uh, a phenomenon known as Mullerian mimicry. And 
basically a lot of the no noxious organisms will have uh, similar color, color patterns and you, you can you can imagine that uh, there's an evolutionary advantage. Um, if you've evolved to have the same color pattern as another noxious species, then a predator doesn't have to uh, have eaten one of your species. It might have eaten one of the others, and they all sort of confer the advantage that uh, I'm going to sting you. you. You attack anybody with a black and yellow pattern on this, um, it's going to hurt. And so a lot of these noxious species will actually have similar patterns. It's a co-mimicry, um, and this is known as Mullerian mimicry. So predators learn to avoid anything that looks like this. Because that is such an evolutionarily powerful advantage, there are some species that um, mimic noxious species, and that's known as Batesian mimicry. And so that's a, a type of mimicry where a harmless species um, it looks like a noxious one. For instance, king snakes look like coral snakes. Um, these little uh, hoverflies look like wasps, even though they are not. They don't have a stinger, but you see this little fly with the black and yellow patterns and you're going to leave it alone. And uh, because of this, the, um, the evolutionary advantage, there was probably one mutant fly that had this color pattern and that one had a much higher survival rate and its offspring did better than the flies that didn't have the color patterns. So you can see from an evolutionary perspective how this would happen. So from an evolutionary perspective, the predators are a very strong evolutionary selective agent for uh, refining prey defense. So obviously the prey that are much better to, able to avoid being eaten are the ones that are going to survive and reproduce and, and their genes will be passed on to their offspring. So there is a very strong evolutionary selection pressure. Um, and so one of the things we find is that uh, the prey, predators will focus in on the more conspicuous members of a population. So those are the ones that might have some sort of mutation and uh, the predator can uh, spot them within a crowd. Uh, if, you can, if you can spot the, the one um, deer that, that has the white coat, and that way you can stay chasing that one. Otherwise, that the normal deer can just blend in with the herd. You lose track of who you're chasing, and then you you switch to a one that still has lots of energy to chase after that one. The white one, eventually, if you just stay zoned in on that one, you're going to take it out of the population. You're going to be able to run it down until it gets tired. So there's a very strong evolutionary pressure for us all to look the same uh, for not standing out. And as you know, from uh, sexual selection, you, you generally uh, prefer the attractiveness of the average looking person. You, the ones that look different, you tend to avoid. And this is um, based on this kind of uh, pressure in an evolutionary sense. It's not a very nice thing to do. Um, so you want things that are very difficult to see. So I, I just pulled a few pictures of some great uh, prey camouflage. Um, the carnivores are trying to eat the uh, nutritionally rich prey defenses. Uh, they can't pick them at will in part because these prey are having a, a very easy time uh, hiding from them. One way is camouflage. So can you find the giraffe in this picture? You can pause it and take a minute here. I'm not going to show you where it is. And move on to the next this is uh it's called a satanic leaf-tailed gecko and he's not only uh good at mimicking that he's a leaf but if a predator comes and grabs him by the tail it'll just break off so that it can still run away and that way uh it, the predator hasn't caught the whole guy 
Okay, this one's going to take you a minute. You might want to pause to take a look at the pika, the American pika. These guys remind me of Pikachu. This is what Pikachu is named after. Uh, you got to look closely for this guy. He's found in, in um, high mountain areas in uh, Canada and the U.S. and the West. Oops, let me go back there. 